Hello, and welcome back to the Prentice Hall Biology textbook. Today we'll be covering Chapter 19, Bacteria and Viruses. 19-1, Bacteria. So classifying prokaryotes. So prokaryotes are divided into two different groups, the eubacteria and the archaebacteria. So the eubacteria is the larger of the prokaryotic kingdoms, and the variety is so great that biologists do not agree on how many phyla are needed to classify this group. And then eubacteria are usually surrounded by a cell wall that protects the cell from injury and determines its shape. And then we have the archaeobacteria. So the archaeobacteria lack, lack the peptidoglycan of eubacteria and also have different membrane lipids. Also, the DNA sequences of key uh, archaeobacteria genes are more like those of eukaryotes than those of eubacteria. And many archaeobacteria live in extremely harsh environments. Okay, identifying prokaryotes. So prokaryotes are identified by characteristics, characteristics such as shape, the chemical nature of their cell walls, the way they move, and the way they obtain energy. So shapes. So there's the bacilli, which are rod-shaped prokaryotes, the cocci, which are spherical, and the spirilla, which are spiral and cork-shaped prokaryotes. Then we have cell walls. So there are two different cell walls found in eubacteria, and uh, we use different types of staining to tell them apart. Next we have movement. So some bacteria move with flagella while others move with cilia. Next, metabolic diversity. So heterotrophs. So chemotrophs take in organic molecules for energy and carbon supply. And then phototrophs use photosynthesis but also need to take in organic compounds such as a carbon source. Next, we uh, the next type of uh, bacteria is an autotroph. So we have photoautotrophs, which use light energy to convert carbon dioxide and water to carbon compounds and oxygen in a process similar to photosynthesis. Then we have chemoautotrophs, which make organic compound molecule, carbon molecules from carbon dioxide, and they don't need light as an energy source. So then releasing energy. How do these different types of bacteria release energy? And energy is released by the processes of cellular respiration. So that there's a, a obligate, aerobes, which are organisms that need a constant supply of oxygen to live, and obligate anaerobes, which are organisms that do not require oxygen. And then we have uh, facultative anaerobes, which can survive with or without oxygen. Okay, next we have growth and reproduction. So one way e bacteria uh, repro reproduce is binary fission. So when a bacterium has grown so that it is nearly doubled in size, it will replicate its DNA and divide in half, producing two identical daughter cells daughter cells. And then there's also conjugation, so when a hollow bridge forms between two bacterial cells and the genes move from one cell to another. Next we have spore formation. So when the growth conditions become unfavorable for a bacteria, many bacteria will form structures called uh, endos endospores. And that's um, is formed when a bacterium produces a thick internal wall that encloses its DNA and a portion of its cell. And these spores can remain dormant for months before being released. Okay, next, importance of bacteria. So bacteria are vital to maintaining the living world. Some are producers that capture energy through, through photosynthesis, while others are decomposers that break down the nutrients and dead matter in the atmosphere. And still other bacteria even have human uses. Okay, decomposers. So without the decomposers, we would lose all nutrients from organic matter. And de decomposers are also used in sewage treatment and can purify water. Next we have nitrogen fixers. So the process of converting nitrogen gas into a form plants can use is known as nitrogen fixation. And many plants have symbiotic relationships with bacteria that do nitrogen fixation. Okay, human uses of bacteria. So bacteria can be used to clean up oil spills, remove waste products from water, or synthesize drugs and chemicals. Okay, 19-2, viruses. So what is a virus? A virus is technically not alive, and they're particles of a nucleic acid, protein, and in some cases, lipids. And they can reproduce only by infecting living cells. A typical virus is composed of a core of DNA or RNA and surrounded by a protein coat. The capsid is what is known as the virus's protein coat. And this includes proteins that allow for the virus to enter a host cell. Then there are bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. Okay, viral infection. So, there's a lytic infection, and in a lytic infection, a virus enters a cell, makes a copy of itself, and causes the cell to burst. An example of this is, ba is bacteriophage T4. 
So the viral mRNA from the virus's DNA is translated into viral proteins that act like a molecular wrecking crew, chopping up the cell's DNA, a, pro which, a process that shuts down the infected host cell. And then because the cell is lysed or destroyed, it's called a lytic infection. Then we have a lysogenic infection. So a lysogenic infection uh, is when the in a host cell makes copies of the virus indefinitely. So in a lysogenic infection, a virus integrates its DNA in the DNA of the host cell. And the viral genetic information replicates along with the host cell's DNA. The viral DNA embedded in the host DNA is called a prophage. Over here, we see the two different forms of infection. Here we have the virus infecting the bacteria with its DNA, and then here down the lytic infection, we see the DNA here, which uh, are released when the cell bursts. With the lysogenic infection, the DNA is actually uh, transcribed into the cell's DNA, and then is reproduced along with the cell. Okay, next we have retroviruses. So retroviruses are uh, viruses that contain RNA as their genetic uh, material. So an example of a retrovirus is AIDS. And these can lie dormant for varying lengths of time. Okay, next, viruses and living cells. So the, the relationship between a virus and a living cell is one of a parasitic. It's the virus feeds off of the living cell. And viruses are at the borderline of living and non-living things. They're not really classified as alive or dead. Okay, 19-3, diseases caused by bacteria and viruses. Okay, so pathogens are disease-causing agents. And next we have bacteria diseases, bacterial diseases in humans. So bacteria produce disease in one, or two, one of two general ways. Some bacteria damage the cells and the tissue of the infected organism directly by breaking down the cells for food, while other bacteria release toxins that travel throughout the body, interfering with the normal activity of the host. So using cells for food, an example of this is the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. And then releasing toxins, an example of this is uh, streptococcus, which causes strep throat. Okay, so preventing bacterial disease. So we use vaccinations, which are a preparation of weakened or killed pathogens, and antibiotics, which are compounds that block the growth and reproduction of bacteria. Okay, next we have controlling bacteria. So there are various methods used to control bacterial growth, including sterilization, disinfectants, and food storage and processing. So sterilization of by heat. So to, we can kill bacteria using heat. And then disinfectants. So disinfectants are chemical solutions that kill pathogenic bacteria. And however, these can create super bacteria. If there's a mutation in the bacteria that allows it to um, survive the disinfectant, it'll keep on breeding and reproducing and form a uh, super bacteria that is immune to disinfectants. And then we have food storage and processing. So food storage and processing, by storing foods in an unfriendly environment, such as a really cold place, we uh, can prevent bacteria from spreading there. And then also cooking food is the same as sterilization of heat. We kill the bacteria. Okay, next we have viral diseases in humans. So like bacteria, viruses produce disease by disrupting the body's normal equilibrium. And these cannot be treated with antibiotics. Okay, next, viral diseases in animals. So this can produce serious animal diseases as well. And then viral diseases in plants. So uh, viruses have a difficult time infecting plants due to the cell walls. It's harder for them to enter the cell. Okay, next we have viroids and prions. So a viroid is a single-stranded RNA molecule that has no surrounding capsid. It's a virus. And then prions are only the protein, and it's short for protein infectious particles. Here we have a chart of different diseases and the different pathogens that cause them along with the areas infected along and mode of transmission. Okay, key concepts. So describe the characteristic of the two kingdoms of prokaryotes. What factors can be used to identify prokaryotes? What are the parts of a virus? Describe the two ways that viruses cause infection. What are the two ways that bacteria cause disease? Describe the th three ways of preventing bacterial growth in food. And then describe how viruses cause disease. All right, that's it for chapter 19.